Hello, this is Brad Hurst again, coming back to you with the uh, next part in our series, The Doctrine of Antichrist. This section is going to be talking about the time from the Jewish revolts to the Aryan Creed, 150 through 686 AD. This is going to be a long video. It's going to be a little more than an hour. This is not going to be some YouTube video talking about dreams or visions or anything like that. If you want to do that, there's plenty of those out there. And to be honest with you, I think those things are useless. Um, what we're doing here, or what I'm doing here, is I'm trying to give you something that you can grab a hold of and say, this is solid. I can use this. If you've got the mind and you've got the time and you've got the endurance, I'm asking you to watch this series and in particular this video all the way to the end. I'm trusting that at the end you are going to be forced to draw, to draw certain conclusions. In fact, you might have to change some of your thinking. And I'm going to challenge you to do that. If you're a pastor and you're listening to this, if you're an elder, you're doing this, or if you're just a housewife and you're doing this, and you've got certain ideas about what you think about Antichrist and where he might come from and so forth, just, just listen to this particular video, if you haven't listened to the other ones, and then challenge yourself. I'm challenging you at the end to change your thinking about this. What I'm giving you is not opinion. It's not theory. It's not speculation. It's, it's fact based on research, and I'm going to put a bibliography at the end. You can go through and get those books and read them yourselves. Okay, But this is what I'm going to give you is fact, and it's going to force us to either ignore it or draw conclusions. When I used to work in the jails as a, as a chaplain, I used to open up every sermon telling people that today the word of God is going to come through here like a plow. You're going to fall on one side or the other. And I think that for you, you're going to have the word of God come to you like a plow. We're going to show you how the word of God develops society. It moves through society and it produces things that it says it's going to produce. The Bible is going to tell us what to look for and we're going to watch history and see if we can find it. Again, thank you for your time. A worldview problem. First John 2.22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. First John 2.18, little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. First John 2.19, they went out from us. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. First John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Second John 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. As we continue our series, we will be looking for either direct statements, clear and necessary inference, or both that connect the below to a particular worldview system. If it does not fit, we will not force it. The worldview we are looking for will do the following. Deny that Jesus is the Christ. Deny the Father and the Son. Originate in the church, but leave the church. Deny that Jesus is come in the flesh. Is come in the flesh. Is come. Erkomi, middle voice of a primary verb. Used only in the present and imperfect tenses. The imperfect, abbreviated imperf, is a verb form found in various languages, 
which combines past tense, reference to a past time, and imperfect aspect, reference to a continuing or repeated event or state. Conclusion, is come in the flesh, refers to the current state of being. Clement of Rome, 90 through 99 AD. We must therefore keep our flesh as a temple of God. For in like manner as you were called in the flesh, you should also come to judgment in the flesh. Our one Lord Jesus Christ, who has saved us, being first a spirit, was made flesh, and so called us. Even so, we also shall in this flesh receive the reward. The current state of reality is that Jesus resides in heaven in his resurrected body and thus calls us. Colossians 2.9 For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. From the time of the early church to the Reformation, there was not a clearly defined Christian worldview. For the most part, Christian apologists and theologians processed the scripture through a Greek Hellenistic worldview. It was not until John Calvin and his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, that a distinctly Christian worldview was put forward. Even Justin Martyr made the mistake of trying to make the case for his faith in the terms of his surrounding culture worldview. However, every now and then a person or group of people would come forward propounding the idea that scripture alone was to be the unadulterated foundation for our thinking. Every thought was to be taken captive and made subject to the Word of God. See 2 Corinthians 10.5, King James Version. Hellenism Hellenism is the assimilation of Greek speech, thought, manners, and culture. See Jewish Encyclopedia. Hellenism was the dominant worldview from the 4th century BC through the Dark Ages. It was reintroduced to the West by Arab philosophers during the Renaissance. The most influential Greek of all time was Plato. His work would shape the world even to modern times. Plato's World of the Forms Plato's theory of forms was the dominant worldview of the pre- and post-New Testament era. It would go on to shape worldviews all the way to our current era. It asserts that the physical world is not really the real world. Instead, ultimate reality exists beyond our physical world. Plato discusses this theory in a few different dialogues, including the most famous one called the Republic. Plato's philosophy asserts that there are two realms, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. The physical realm is the material stuff we see and interact with on a daily basis. This physical realm is changing and imperfect, as we know all too well. The spiritual realm, however, exists beyond the physical realm. Plato calls this spiritual realm the realm of forms, also called the realm of ideas or realm of ideals. Plato's theory of forms asserts that the physical realm is only a shadow or image of the true reality of the realm of forms. The net result in Plato's thinking is that the world we live in is a mere shadow of what the real world is. In our world, a square, cube, circle, or any other thing is an imperfect image of the real thing in the world of the forms. In reality, our world cannot really tell us anything about the other world, and the other world cannot be effectively communicated to our world. When it comes to spirit beings like God or angels, 
there must be some sort of intermediate means by which communication of any sort can take place. Hence, God, the highest of forms, cannot be known. Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the practical outworking of Plato's world of the forms. Consider this from Edersheim. In the course of this history, I have sometimes indicated the bearing of Jewish thought upon ecclesiastical history, and especially on the origin of Gnosticism. Without entering on the common causes of all mysticism, every student must have felt some difficulty in accounting for the sudden rise of Gnostic sects and for the apparent extravagances of their systems, the more so coming so soon after the promulgation of Christian truth. Gnosticism derived its principal elements from the synagogue. Again, see Edersheim. Like the latter Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, Gnosticism sprang from the contact of Judaism with the religious speculations of the farther east. Thus, the traditional founder of Gnosticism was a Samaritan, Simon of Gita, who since the time of Justin Martyr has commonly, but perhaps erroneously, been identified with the Simon Magus mentioned in Acts 8.2. The second heresiarch and leader of the Gnostics, to whom ecclesiastical history refers, was Menander, like Simon, a Samaritan by birth. Under his auspices and those of his successors, Gnosticism assumed more and more its definite shape. In general, that system had two great branches the one in which the doctrine of emanation played an important part and derived from Persian elements, the other, more dualistic, an attempt to combine theology with Platonism and bearing traces of Alexandrian culture. The former emphasized law and the latter emphasized license. The most famous Gnostics of the Bible were the Hellenistic Jews of Alexandria who were from Philo's school. Philo was a Hellenistic Platonized Jew. He was heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism. He was steeped into Gnostic thought and pioneered the concept of the Logos in a Jewish Platonic framework. He associated the Logos with the wisdom incarnate as the Logos is involved with Yahweh in making the world of the forms. It was Philo's students who were present in Acts 6-9 to them, Stephen was an archon of the Demarurge. Stephen took what to the Gnostics were myths set in historical context and made them absolute. Basic Beliefs of the Gnostics A. Gnosticism is the teaching based on Gnosis, the knowledge of transcendence, elevation of one's self above others, arrived at by way of interior intuitive means. B. It is expressed through the medium of myth. The term myth should not be here taken to mean stories that are not true, but rather that the truths embodied in these myths are of a different order from the dogmas of theology or the statements of philosophy. C. The world is flawed because it was created in a flawed manner. Humans are keenly aware of this and know that they are strangers living in a world that is flawed and absurd. D. The blame for the world's failings lies not with humans, but with the Creator. E. The person or thing, supreme being, who is known as God, did not create. He dwells in darkness, mystery and cannot be known. Things both seen and unseen spontaneously emanated from it slash him and thus all came into existence. F. Out of God's emanation came the eons. 
These are deific beings, all of whom comprise the fullness, parama, of deity. G. One of the Iano beings is Sophia, wisdom. In the course of his her journeying, Sophia came to emanate from his her own being a flawed consciousness. This being thought it was the creator of the material and psychic cosmos, all of which they created in the image of their own flaw. This being, unaware of their origins, imagined themselves to be the ultimate and absolute God. They are called Demiragos or Demirurg, the half maker. Because of their self delusion, they did not know that the material world already existed and that they fashioned things from pre existing matter. The Demirurg and its rulers, Archons, are fooled into thinking the Demirurg actually created and is a supreme being. All ethics and morality originate from the Demirurs and are designed to keep us from being like them. H. Humans are part made by the original emanation mentioned in C above and are part made by the Demirurs. The spirit, divine spark, is from the first and the body from the latter. Most humans are unaware of this dichotomy. Most mistake the Demirurs for the true God. The world spirit in exile must go through the inferno of matter and the purgatory of morals to arrive at the spiritual paradise. Note, the Demirurs has made mistakes, like putting the wrong spirit in the wrong body. Note, it should be noted that homosexuality was seen in part as an awakening slash enlightening of the spirit and its true identity. To the Hellenists, that would mean that the homosexual has moved forward in the Gnosis. I. To be liberated from this predicament, human beings require help, although they must also contribute their own efforts. Messengers of light are sent to assist us. Sin is not the issue. Ignorance is. It is not ignorance of truth and error. It is inner awareness of oneself. Messengers of light, like Jesus, awaken us to our reality, but it is up to us to carry it further. Note, there are human counselors who are to assist us in applying the knowledge that we have received. J. Every man must determine his own path. No man can judge another man's path or his progress. The ultimate goal is to reach the fullness pleroma of deity. Those who fail to do so are sent back to try again. Eventually, everyone will make it and the demiurge will be defeated. The idea of a resurrection of the body is considered absurd. K. The evidence that you either did or did not do well in the past was your social status. The more well off you were was the proof of how well you did in the past. The lower classes were not allowed to be doers of gnosis, philosophize. They were to only be listeners, hearers of those elevated slash initiated to the higher understanding of gnosis. Those who were of the higher classes were prohibited from helping relieving the poor. To do so would keep them from learning what they needed to be elevated the next time around. Christianity through the Bible was supposed to be contrary to the prevailing worldview of Hellenism slash Gnostic thought. Let's have a look. One. Elevation of oneself above others, versus Philippians 2.3. Let each esteem other better than themselves. 2. The world was created in a flawed manner, versus Genesis 1.31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. 3. 
the blame lies with the creator versus James 1.13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Four, God dwells in darkness and cannot be known. Verses 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Five, the fullness of deity is found in the aeonic being who God thinks he created. Verses Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. Six, there can be no direct connection between God and the physical world. Verses 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Seven, we need human counselors to help us apply the knowledge we receive. Verses 1 John 2.27, the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. This is not to disparage the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists that God gave us as gifts for the equipping of the saints. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. John was responding to the Gnostic idea that one needed a counselor to assist one in applying the knowledge one received. 8. The absurdity of the resurrection of the dead versus Acts 26.8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Nine, every man chooses his own path versus Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. Ten, no man can judge another, verses 1 Corinthians 5, 12, and 13. Do not ye judge them that are within, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Eleven, hearers cannot be doers, verses James 1, 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Twelve, leaving the poor in their condition for their own good, versus James 2.16. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? 1 John 3.7 But whoso has the world's good, and sees his brother have need, and shut his vows of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Thirteen, the higher your status is the proof of the further along in gnosis you are. Verses 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 26 through 28. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. The Destruction of the Intent of Myth If you recall, back in my series, Ancient Astronomy and the Great Red Dragon, we learned that the ancients recorded and passed down their astronomical observations through the language of myth. They did so with the intent of assisting us in tracking the procession of the equinoxes and solstices. This language was essential in being able to properly discern the signs and seasons of the Masoreth. See Genesis 1.14. Instead, Plato applied myth to fables using Homeric verse. These stories were not intended for anything more than to serve as allegories for a deeper meaning to each reader. Thus, the very system of the Masoreth that God would use to signal the impending fulfillment of the major prophetic events was sidelined and even shunned. It remains so to this day.
Origen, 184 through 253 AD. Whether for good or for bad, it is difficult to describe the impact that Origen would have on all things Christian. He was raised in a Christian home and was committed to the Christian community at a very early age. His father was sentenced to death for his faith and Origen at the age of 17 wanted to join him. However, his mother hid his clothes, which prevented him from leaving the house. No one could doubt Origen's love for the Christian community. However, it was his love for Greek literature and philosophy that would bring him into disrepute. Gnostic teaching had been taken a beating by the first and second century apologists. However, it still continued to influence the church in the West during the third century. As mentioned at the start of this video, Christian apologists assume the validity of certain portions of Hellenism and thus try to defeat it with Hellenism. Time and time again, this proved to be a fatal flaw for all who tried it. Origen would be no different. Though he assumed the superiority of the scriptures in thought, indeed, he constantly made it yield to Platonism. The most lasting impact of Origen was his hermeneutics. He literally borrowed from the Gnostic caste system and applied it to biblical learning. Accordingly, every passage of the Bible has a three-part meaning, thus rendering exegesis and hermeneutics useless. 1. The historical literal interpretation. Accordingly, this is the most simplistic of the three and meant for the more simple among us. It is based on the actual propositional statements of the passage. Two, the personal meaning slash application of the passage. Literally, what does it mean for you? Finding this meaning brings spiritual development. Three, the allegory of the passage. This is where the deepest understanding of the passage is revealed to those who would seek it. It is at this level that only the most spiritual and mature among us can attain. This is nothing more than the use of Homeric verse as described in Platonism. But a lone voice stood out against Origen. Tertullian, 155 through 240 AD. 220 AD, despite his piety, Origen had helped to strengthen the philosophical influences. Tertullian had long since warned the churches of the danger, but a greater than Tertullian was needed now to free them from their bondage to philosophy. Here's a quote. What indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? Tertullian, the prescription against heretics, seven. Manny, the Sassanians, and a new Zoroastrian, Zarathustran Empire. For the third century Mesopotamians, to their way of thinking, the mass of ignorant humanity was deceived in accepting the logic of rationality and the evidence of the senses. A glimpse of the underlying true nature of things is granted to only a select few by the divine powers. The glimpse was the Gnosis. With the events of Hadrian's war and the death of the Adia Bean family by Trajan, the Parthian Empire would undergo a radical change resulting in a totally new empire. This new Sassanian Empire 224 to 651 AD under Ardashir and Shapur, 224 and 242 AD, would see a radical change in the way Zoroastrianism was practiced. A Magi by the name of Kedar was appointed to, to the position of high priest. Due to the impact of Christianity, the cult of Mithras was being decimated in the West. 
By this time, in the East, Gnostic thinking was essentially seen as the doctrinal and practical components of Christianity. Keter fully understood that this new way of thinking was essentially Hellenistic in nature and was first introduced under Alexander some 800 years prior. It was Keter's goal to replace all of Hellenism with a new and intolerant Zoroastrianism. Without a doubt, the most influential Gnostic in Mesopotamia and anywhere else was a man by the name Mani. His teaching was called Manichaeism. He introduced a Zoroastrian pseudo-Christian Gnostic worldview. He was known as the fulfillment of the coming paraclete, claimed to be without sin, and was reported to have performed many miracles and healings. To the multitudes, he was known as the prophet. Manny's power and influence was felt as far east as China, where a Manachian state was established among the Turks in what is called Uyghurstan. The power of these people were felt all across Mongolia and into parts of Manchuria. Manny would later be known as the Buddha and Lao Tzu, founder of Taoism. Note, later on in this series, some of the above will play a big role in understanding the events surrounding Antichrist. Keter ordered the death of Manny and hunted him for years. Keter's efforts would eventually pay off, but he would not live to see it. It was Keter's successor who, two years after Keter's death, would eventually oversee the execution of Manny. But despite his death, the influence of Manny would last for many centuries. His combination of Zoroastrian slash pseudo-Christian slash Gnostic influence would go on to influence art, culture, religion, and empires. The pseudo-Christian connection with Manny put many believers in the Sassanian Empire at risk. They either had to find a way to adapt or risk persecution. Because of Origen's approach to the Bible, the means of adaptation would come to them through Alexandria, but would take about 100 years to develop and make its way to them. The Aryan Controversy For most of its first 300 years, the church was primarily engaged in a struggle to survive. While there were some reprieves and some doctrinal issues were addressed, although minimally, the persistent persecution by the authorities kept the church from forming a cohesive doctrine on a variety of issues. The Edict of Milan issued by Constantine in 312 would change that. Christianity would become the official state religion and persecution essentially would stop. Arius, 256 through 336 AD. Arius was a disciple of the greatest critic of his time, the venerated martyr Lucian of Antioch, a known textual critic. Arius had a name for learning, and his letters bear witness to his dialectical skill and mastery of subtle irony. As soon as Christianity was established as a lawful worship, by Constantine through the Edict of Milan in 312, the churches were crowded with converts and inquirers of all sorts. A church which claims to be universal cannot pick and choose like a petty sect, but must receive all comers. Now these were mostly heathens with the thinnest possible varnish of Christianity. 
It was the teaching of Arius that enabled them to use the language of Christians without giving up their heathen ways of thinking. In other words, the world was ready to accept the gospel as a sublime monotheism, and the Lord's divinity was the one great stumbling block which seemed to hinder its conversion. Arius would provide a welcome explanation of the difficulty. Arius was a cultured and ascetic presbyter, a popular preacher from Libya. He was tall, handsome, earnestly religious, and eloquent in his arguments. He was a dangerous enemy. His austere life and novel doctrines, his dignified character and championship of common sense and religion made him the idol of ladies and the common people. Arius was but one of many who were measuring the heights of heaven with their puny logic and sounding the depths of wisdom with the plummet of the schools, Greek Academy. Men who agreed in nothing else agreed in this practical subordination of revelation to philosophy. It starts from the accepted belief that the unity of God excludes not only distinctions inside the divine nature, but also contact with the world. Thus, the God of Arius is an unknown God whose being is hidden in eternal mystery. No creature can reveal him, and he cannot reveal himself. But if he is not to touch the world, he needs a minister of creation. The Lord Jesus is rather such a minister than the conqueror of death and sin. Arius proclaimed a God of mystery, unfathomable to the Son of God himself. He based much of what he taught on the premise of the Greek worldview and an errant reading of John 1.18. Proper reading. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. King James Version. Begotten refers to sonship. Arian preference. No one hath seen God at any time the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. New American Standard Bible. Begotten refers to divinity. For his followers, Arius had plenty of telling arguments. Did the Son of God exist before his generation? Or to the women, were you a mother before you had a child? He knew also how to cultivate his popularity by pastoral visiting and by issuing a multitude of theological songs for sailors and millers and wayfarers. He and his disciples would eventually be excommunicated by Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria. To Arius, the deep things of God, whether in philosophy or scripture, were too high for the common folk. If they tried to grapple with said thoughts and virtues, they would only corrupt both the doctrine and the hearers of said things. To Arius, one need to only teach the application to the people and not bother them with high thoughts. However, it backfired. The people neither had the gospel nor the power of doctrine to sanctify. Over the years of the controversy, Arians found it necessary to pass laws forcing the people into virtuous living. When Constantine stood before the world as the patron of the gospel, he felt bound to settle the question of Arianism. The dispute in Alexandria was poised to bring civil war in the province of Egypt. Constantine shared the heathen feelings of his time, 
so that the gospel to him was only a monotheistic heathenism. Thus Arianism came up to his idea of it, and the whole controversy seemed a mere affair of words. A letter was sent to both Alexander and Arius regarding the issue. Constantine therefore invited all Christian bishops inside and outside the empire to meet him at Nicaea in Bithynia during the summer of 325 in order to make a final end of all the disputes which endangered the unity of Christendom. They came from as far away as Spain and India, from the far north to below the Nile. It was Constantine's hope that all would adopt the position of Arius, providing a big tent approach for both the church and the empire. More than 300 showed up, with a great number of them leaning to the Arian position. The Arians must have come full of hope to the council. So far theirs was the winning side. They had a powerful friend at court in the emperor's sister, Constantia, and an influential connection in the learned Lucianic circle. Reckoning also on the natural conservatism of Christian bishops, on the timidity of some, and on the simplicity or ignorance of others, they might fairly expect that if their doctrine was not accepted by the council, it would at least escape formal condemnation. They hoped, however, to carry all before them. An Arianizing creed was therefore presented by a score or so of bishops, headed by the courtier Eusebius of Nicomedia. But something unexpected occurred. A man who accompanied Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria, spoke up. He was a very young deacon by the name of Athanasius. He took on the entire council with the emperor present and did so from an exclusively scriptural presentation. For the first time since the time of the apostles, someone discarded Hellenism in favor of a scripture alone apologetic. His presentation was so powerful that when the remaining Arians tried to present an Arian creed, it was torn up and a Nicene Athanasian creed was introduced in its place. Arius and those unwilling to sign the creed were exiled. Others signed it with the intent of coming back to undermine it. In 328 AD, Athanasius became Bishop of Alexandria. Egypt soon became a stronghold of the Nicene faith, for Athanasius could sway the heart of Greek and Copt alike. But one of the exiled Arians, Eusebius of Nicomedia, convinced Constantine to bring the Arians out of exile. From that point on, the Arians began to go about the process of deposing all of the Nicaeans from their positions. From 330 through 334, ten bishops would be deposed. Athanasius was charged with tyranny in Alexandria and accused of withholding grain from Constantinople. He walked out of the trial, was tried in abstention, and found guilty. He was subsequently exiled to Germany. Arius was to be restored to communion and his see, but died the day before in a parade celebrating his return. In November of 337 AD, Constantine died. His legacy was great in many ways. He ended persecution and provided the venue for which orthodoxy could be decided. However, his greatest yet indirect contribution to the church was that he had built such an impregnable city, Constantinople, that it would serve as a refuge for the Nicaeans for over 1,000 years. Constantine's son, Constantius, brought Athanasius and the other deposed bishops back. However, Eusebius saw his chance. Now that Constantine was dead, a schism could be set afoot at Alexandria. So the Arians were encouraged to hold assemblies of their own, and eventually Athanasius was expelled by the apostate prefect Phlegrius and fled to Rome, and Gregory of Cappadocia was installed by military violence in the place of Athanasius. Scenes of outrage were enacted all over Egypt. In the absence of the Nicaeans in the East, new creed after new creed was put forth for over 20 years. 
The Arians put forth falsified documentation in various forms to falsify the letters from the Nicaeans, authenticate the age of the Arian position, and discredit the Nicaeans. They even produced altered scriptures. When the Sardican envoys Vincent of Capua and Euphrates of Cologne came eastward in the spring of 344, a harlot was brought one night into their lodgings. Great was the scandal when the plot was traced up to the Eusebian leader, Stephen of Antioch. Stephen's crime had discredited the whole gang of Arians. Once again, Athanasius was restored. Constantius received him graciously, though insincerely, at Antioch, ordered all the charges against him to be destroyed, and gave him a solemn promise of full protection for the future. Athanasius went forward on his journey, and the old confessor Maximus assembled the bishops of Palestine to greet him at Jerusalem. But his entry into Alexandria, October 346, was the crowning triumph of, of his life. For miles along the road, the great city streamed out to meet him with enthusiastic welcome, and the jealous police of Constantius could raise no tumult to mar the universal harmony of that great day of national rejoicing. In 353 AD, Constantius became the sole emperor of the empire from the Atlantic to the Persian front. While he had no desire to disturb Athanasius directly, he felt differently about the Nicaeans of the West. He deposed three of the Nicaean bishops, men like Polenius of Terrier, Dionysius of Milan, and Hillier of Poitiers, of whom mere creatures of the palace were no match for. Doctrine was therefore kept in the background, and the emperor installed Aaron bishops in their place. Constantius demanded a condemnation of Athanasius from the remaining bishops, but got none. He offered one up and dared any to resist him. This all the while when Athanasius was at peace in Egypt, resting on the promise of protection. With Athanasius in place, the emperor felt like he could not control Egypt. Despite his promise, Constantius sent General Serranus to capture Athanasius. He came with 5,000 troops and captured the entire congregation, but Athanasius escaped to Ethiopia, where he governed Alexandria and all of Egypt in exile by letters. For the first time since the last revolt of the Jews, a nation was resisting the emperor. In Egypt, the Greeks and Copts were united in defense of the Nicene faith, as Egypt was devoted to the faith. As hard as Constantius tried to gain the victory in Egypt, other pressing affairs distracted him the barbarians of the north and the Persians of the east. Constantius was pressed from all sides. He died of a fever in 361 AD. Having no heir, the throne fell to his nephew, Julian, known as Julian the Apostate. Julian was only emperor for about two years, 361 through 363 AD. But despite his short reign, he would do something that would be a game changer in the Arian controversy. Being raised in solitude by hypocritical Arian Christians, he had no taste for Christianity. We may state generally that he aimed at degrading Christianity into a vulgar superstition by, by breaking its connections with civilized government on the one side and with liberal education on the other. One part of it was to deprive the Galileans of state support and weed them out as far as might be from the public service, while still leaving them full freedom to quarrel among themselves. The other was to cut them off from literature by forbidding them to teach the classics. Homer and Hesiod were prophets of the gods and must not be expounded by unbelievers. Matthew and Luke were good enough for the barbarian ears like theirs. Every blow struck at Christianity by Julian fell first on the Arianizers, whom Constantius had left in power, and the reaction he provoked against heathen learning directly threatened the philosophical postulates of Arianism within the church. The net result was that only the pagans could read and expound on Greek literature, and the Christian world could only engage in disputes through the scriptures. This was a gift to the Nicaeans. With only the scriptures to reason with, 
churches began to adopt the Nicene Creed one by one. Despite his tolerance, Julian could not but see that Athanasius was master in Egypt. He may not have cared about the council, but the baptism of some heathen ladies at Alexandria roused his fiercest anger. He broke his rule of contemptuous toleration and the detestable Athanasius was in exile again before the summer was over. With regard to the prohibitions, the only thing the Arians could do was try to Hellenize the scriptures by reducing them to Homeric verse. It was hoped that the scriptures would also be prohibited. Among the efforts in doing so was to deny the humanity of Christ by stating that he had, did not have a spirit. Despite their efforts, it did not work. In 363, Julian was killed in a battle with the Persians. The next two emperors were decidedly Nicene, Jovian and Valentius. Jovian died in 364 and was succeeded by Valentius. Valentius appointed his brother Valens to the Eastern Kingdom. He was Nicene, but allowed for the semi-Aryans to continue. But his wife was Arian, and thus Valens began to move against the Nicenes. However, despite the influence of Valens and his wife, Arianism suffered blow after blow for two reasons. One, other doctrinal issues consistently buttressed the Nicene position. Two, the character of the Arians became a major stumbling block to Arianism itself. In 372, Athanasius died in peace in Alexandria. Soon after, a sea change of theology would take place that would last for more than a thousand years. The Arians, by force and corruption, would take control of Egypt and never doctrinally cede it again. In addition, developments in the north were underway that would redraw the boundary lines between Arians and Nicaeans. In the north, the Huns of the steppes had driven the pseudo-Christian Goth warriors south to the Danube River. The Goths had been evangelized by a man by the name of Ufias, Wolf, who was an Arian. He had converted the Goths through the use of a very errant Bible. When the Huns drove the Goths south, they sat on the Danube, wedged between the Huns and the Romans. The Romans allowed the Goths refuge, but took advantage of them in doing so. As a result, the Goths organized under Fitzgerald and began to drive back the Roman legions. This action by the Goths made Emperor Valens livid and thus he set forth to drive out the Goths. Valens sent Sebastian the Manichae, who was once an enemy of Athanasius, to drive out the Goths. Sebastian was defeated and Valens was captured and killed. Valens' 20-year-old nephew, Gratian became emperor with a certain level of wisdom. He rightly deduced that if others before him struggled with an empire, how should he be any different? Thus he appointed Theodosius over the east. Thus the sea change began. During the transition, the Nicaeans began a major evangelistic push among the Arians of Constantinople who were pouring into the city. The Nicaean efforts were very successful. Theodosius successfully set out to drive back the Goths. Upon their defeat, Theodosius treated the Goth leaders with honor and dignity. The whole of the Vishgoth, Eastern Goth army, gave their allegiance to Theodosius. Those in the West surrendered, surrendered to Gratian. Theodosius became ill and requested baptism at the hands of Asculius, a radical Nicene. Theodosius recovered and began the process of moving against Arianism in the Eastern Empire. A. His first rescript, February 27, 380, commanded all men to follow the Nicene doctrine committed by the apostles Peter to the Romans and now professed by the Massus of Rome and Peter of Alexandria. 
and plainly threatened to impose temporal punishments on the heretics. Theodosius made his formal entry into Constantinople November 24, 380, and at once required the bishop either to accept the Nicene faith or to leave the city. Demophilus honorably refused to give up his heresy and adjourned his services to the suburbs. So ended the 40 years of Arian domination in Constantinople. B. The next edict, January 381, forbade heretical discussions and assemblies inside cities and ordered the churches everywhere to be given up to the Nicaeans. C. A new council was convened and the Arians slash Manichees were not invited. Theodosius was no longer neutral between Constantinople and Alexandria. Me. At the council, the issue of the Holy Spirit was to be decided. D. The next move was to find out whether the semi-Arians were willing to share the victory of the Nicene, i.e. their inclusion of the Holy Spirit in the sphere of co-essential deity. Those of the semi-Arians who were willing to join the Nicene had already done so, and the rest were obstinate. They withdrew from the council and gave up their churches like the Arians. E. A new edict in July forbade Arians of every sort to build churches. Even their old liberty to build outside the walls of cities was now taken from them. At the end of the month, Theodosius issued an amended definition of orthodoxy. Henceforth, sound belief was to be guaranteed by communion, no longer with Rome and Alexandria, but with Constantinople, Alexandria, and the chief bishops of the East. Thus, the whole of Asia Minor would remain Nicene for the next 1,000 plus years, and Constantinople would be the guardian of said doctrine. In the Latin West, the Roman Empire would collapse altogether in 476 AD as the Ostgoths slash Western Goths and Teutons would overrun the countryside and bring their Arian doctrine with them. Eventually, Arianism became associated with the enemy and one by one, kingdom after kingdom fell to the Nicene doctrine. By 800 AD, Arian doctrine was vanquished in both the East and West. Its only bastions were in North Africa and from Syria going into Persia. In the Eastern Empire following Theodosius, there were a number of other conflicts, but all of them were essentially decided for the Nicene, now Trinitarian cause. Emperor Justinian 482 through 565 AD built a church for the commemoration and teaching of the Nicene slash Trinitarian victory over the Arians and the Manichees. The church was called the Hagia Sophia for holy wisdom. It was constructed in 537 AD. But Justinian did something even more drastic. Realizing the, the connection between Greek philosophy and Arianism, Justinian kicked the Greek academy out of the empire. It fled east, first to Haran, Syria, and eventually to India. Though some survived, Justinian would go on to order the burning of all of Origen's literary works. He would go on to nearly reunite the entire empire all across Af North Africa to Europe, wrecking havoc on the Arians. In 550 AD, the Black Plague devastated parts of Asia Minor, Persia, Egypt, China, and Syria. Both Greek Asia Minor slash Byzantine slash Anatolia slash Turkey and Sassanian slash Persian fortresses and cities in Syria were depopulated. The local tribal people simply moved in and took over. They were from Syria and Arabia. They were nomadic and thus barely touched by the plague. They were made up of primarily those produced by the marriages between Alexander's men 
and the Persian women. He called them Arabs, which is an Aramaic Syrian word meaning to mix or mingle, as in mixing iron and clay. Strong's Concordance, 861-51. Arab, Aramaic. The word is used only three times in the Bible, Daniel 2.41 and 2.43, when talking about the ten toes of the image. Did you get that? The word Arab is a word that is only used three times. It is in Daniel 2, 41 and 43. It means to mix as in iron and clay. This is what we call a clue. Where is it pointing to? Here? Or here? As the Aryans continued to suffer defeat after defeat, they continually fled east to Syria and into Persia. This became a real problem for the Sassanian king Khosro II, who, although a pseudo-Christian, was trying to continue a pure Zoroastrian society. He determined to end the debate altogether by uniting all Jews and Aryans behind his army with the promise that if victorious, they could have the conquered empire. Persia was also aided by the Aryan Avars of the Gok Turk areas and Slavs. If victorious, the Jews could have Palestine and the rest would go to the others. The emperor of Constantinople was Heraclius. In 426, the Persian armies attacked, moving with lightning speed. Constantinople was surrounded and victory seemed all but certain. Khosro had taken the relic of the cross from Jerusalem to Persia and put it on display as a token of victory. Heraclius and his small army had fled north. The people of Constantinople and the Nicaeans hid behind the walls a total of four years. Learning from Alexander, Heraclius looked to the book of Daniel for comfort. He determined, though an heir, he could be the goat from the west to defeat Persia. He formed a plan that seemed almost doomed to fail. He took his army north and hid among the Goths. As he did so, Khosro clogged the port of Constantinople with the entire Persian navy. The ships were so thick one could walk from ship to ship. What they did not know was that Heraclius was drawing them in, for he had a secret weapon. When the winds changed, the order was given. The Greeks launched a weapon that today we still not, do not understand. Greek fire. Like napalm, they literally sprayed the Persian navy with fire from inside Constantinople. The winds kept the Persians from fleeing, and thus the Persian navy was sunk. As panic set in, Heraclius attacked with his army and the Goths. The Persians were driven all the way to the Persian Gulf. Khosro was killed and the relic of the cross restored to its place. The victory of Heraclius had been dubbed the greatest military comeback ever recorded. Angry at their losses and with Persia being weak from war and pestilence, the Arabs overran Persia. The Zoroastrian priests were driven out of power with most fleeing to India and taking refuge among Christians elsewhere. A system of rule was established called a caliphate, and it was established in Syria. Heraclius wisely withdrew from Syria and North Africa. He simply did not have the resources to occupy it. Thus, the Aryan Arabs simply walked in and were greeted with open arms. Under the second caliph, Abd al-Malik, 70.85 through 705, the Arabs together with the Jews went on to sack Jerusalem. Originally, Malik promised to rebuild the temple, but for several reasons, this did not come to pass. However, Malik set out to build a counterpart to the Hagia Sophia to exalt the Aryan doctrine. The Aryan creed would be written on the inside of the structure.
Some have postulated that the place was strategically picked to emphasize the non-deity of Christ. The place being what is called the Temple Mount so as to draw attention to what is called the Western Wailing Wall. If part of the temple is there, then Jesus was wrong regarding no stone being left on top of another. The structure was to be an instructional tool as well as a counterpart. In the structure, Jesus is given the title of the chosen or elect. The word they used was originally of Ugaritic origin dating from around 1200 BC in the Canaanite areas of Lebanon. It was used to describe the quality of gold being mined in the area. The word is pronounced Muhammad. The Aramaic variation is Muhammad. It was a title for Jesus. The word that was used to describe his religion was also an Aramaic world, word. It means peace and is pronounced Islam. Today, we know the structure as the Dome of the Rock. Note, the following is an English translation of the inscriptions on the inside of the Dome of the Rock. It is in part purposefully mistranslated so as to not translate the word Muhammad, chosen, or elect, and Islam, peace, thus leaving the impression that a person by the name of Muhammad is being referred and his religion is Islam. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Unto him belongeth sovereignty, and unto him belongs praise. He quickens and gives death, and he has power over all things. Muhammad, chosen, is the servant of God and his messenger. Lo, God and his angels shower blessings on the prophet. O ye who believe, Ask blessings on him and salute him with a worthy salutation. The blessing of God be upon him and peace be on him. And may God have mercy. O people of the book, do not exaggerate your religion nor utter aught concerning God save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of God. And his word which he conveyed unto Mary and a spirit from him. So believe in God and his messengers, and say not three. Cease, it is better for you. God is only one God. Far be it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. His is all that is in the heavens, and all that is is in the earth. And God is sufficient as defender. The Messiah will never scorn to be a servant unto God, nor will the favored angels. Whoso scorns his service and is proud, all such will he assemble unto him. O God, bless your messenger and your servant, Jesus, son of Mary. Peace be on him the day he was born, and the day he dies, and the day he will be raised alive. Such was Jesus, son of Mary. This is a statement of the truth concerning which they doubt. It befitteth not the majesty of God that he should take unto himself a son. Glory be to him. When he decrees a thing, he says unto it only, Be, and it is. Lo, God is my Lord and your Lord, so serve him. That is the right path. God himself is witness that there is no God. Save him and the angels and the men of learning. They too are witnesses. Maintaining his creation in justice. There is no God save him. The almighty, the wise, lo, religion with God is Islam, peace. Those who formerly received the book differed only after knowledge came unto them through the transgression among themselves, who disbelieves the revelations of God, will find that low. God is swift at reckoning.
In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Say he is God, the one, God, the eternally besought of all. He, he begetteth not, nor was begotten, and there is none comparable unto him. Muhammad, chosen, is the messenger of God. The blessings of God be upon him. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Muhammad, chosen, is the messenger of God. Lo, God and his angels shower blessings on the prophet. O ye who believe, ask blessings on him and salute him with a worthy salutation. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but God. He is one. Praise be to God, who hath not taken unto himself a son, and who hath no partner in the sovereignty. Nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence, and magnify him with all magnificence. Muhammad, chosen, is a messenger of God. The blessing of God be upon him, and the angels and his prophets, and peace be on him, that, and may God have mercy. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Unto him belongeth sovereignty, and unto him belongeth praise. He quickens, and he gives death, and he has power over all things. Muhammad, chosen, is the messenger of God. The blessing of God be upon him. May he accept his intercession on the day of judgment on behalf of his people. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Muhammad is the messenger of God. The blessing of God be on him. The dome was built by the servant of God, Abed, Allah Ayman al mumin commander of the faithful in the year 2 and 70. May God accept from him, may God accept from him and be content with him. Amen. Lord of the worlds, praise be to God. The words Allah the Ayman Mamum were written over Al Malik, the original builder of 687 AD. In other words, Abbot Al Malik was the original builder, and someone by the name of Ayman Mamum came and scratched out Malik's name and put his name over the top of it. This is actually recorded in a book called The Hidden Origins of Islam by Heinz and Poonin in 2012, page 126. Prometheus books. Great, great book, but it is a monster of a book to read, believe me. In addition, Malik is the first known to strike coins with the word Muhammad on them. Although Muhammad was a title for Jesus as chosen, it is telling to see that on the coin Muhammad is wearing the crescent moon horns of Marduk and his star Nabiru. Let's compare this with the Nicene Creed. Here we have the Nicene Creed amended in 381 AD. By the way, this is the amended version that includes the decisions of uh, regarding the Holy Spirit. So you have the full Trinitarian statement here. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten, of, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. That's incredibly important. That was the whole argument over the Arian controversy. By whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father, 
and he shall come again in glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So in the Arian Creed of the Dome of the Rock, we have a denial of the fatherhood of God, the sonship of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, his eternal nature, and his current status of being in a human body in heaven. The Arians were in the church and left the church when given a chance to repent, which takes us back to what we put forward from 1 John in slides 2 through 4 of this presentation. The people of the book is contrasted to the men of learning, the Gnosis. It was only when the people of the book got knowledge of the book did they fall into the air. This according to the Arian position. First John 2.22 Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 1 John 2.18 Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. 1 John 2.19 They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Well, folks, this is obviously not an exhaustive study of that entire period. I mean, I've given you probably about 15% of at least the information that I've come across. But I hope that, that if you've gone, come through this, or if you've worked your way through this, that you're at least sitting back and thinking Okay, this, for me, I, I just, for the life of me, do not understand why this stuff is not taught in the churches. Maybe it's because we have a society that's built upon keep it simple, stupid, and we've got uh, teachers in the church that actually think that way and teach that way. I don't know. I don't know. But I know for me that this is life-changing stuff, and it basically causes me to reconnoiter my life and to seek the things of Christ, and not be concerned with the issues of sin and so forth that are out there. Well, anyway, uh, we will continue this series uh, in the next couple of weeks. I'll, I'll, I'll be getting another video together. We'll be going even further with this because there's so much more to go even beyond here. But uh, as I promised, there will be a, bibli a, um, a bibliography that will uh, follow this slide and uh, at least give you some resources you can go to. I'm sure I couldn't footnote everything. It just, uh, th these things take a lot of time and so forth. And uh, I'm certainly glad to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about it. I'd be glad to do so. Again, thank you for the time that you took to listen to this video and uh, or this, to this presentation. And uh, may the Lord bless you as you continue to search for the truth. Amen.